Well, Dr. Derek Sherman, thank you so much for joining us on A Pastor and a Philosopher Walking to a Bar. Yeah, great to be with you, and thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. So, Derek, um, we have you, know, you can tell by our outline, we've been chomping at the bit to talk to someone about AI. So we gave you a bajillion pages of notes that, with questions on them. We're chomping at the bit. But can you tell us why, who you are, what you do, what's your area of expertise, and why are we chomping at the bit to talk about AI with you? Yeah. Um, well, I'll leave the last question for you to answer. But I, <laughs> uh, I'm basically uh, been working for the last 20 years as a professor of computer science, uh, most recently at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And um, prior to that, I worked as an engineer for about a decade or so, uh, roughly a decade. Um, and my PhD sort of area of research, which was now yeah, going on 20 years ago, was using machine learning in the field of robotics and computer vision. And uh, and already at that time, I noticed there was a lot of people um, basically trying to apply machine learning for computer vision in the area of face recognition. That was sort of a hot topic. A lot of the cool kids were doing face recognition. And it sort of struck me that that was a problematic application area, that there was all kinds of you know pitfalls. And... Um, and so my instincts sort of nudged me to kind of look at other areas for applying that. And so eventually, uh, when I finished my graduate work, I went on to establish a bit of a research program looking at things like uh, the recycling, um, using the vi uh, machine learning for visual recycling of goods. So so using it to help sort recyclable materials. Hmm. Um, and of course, in the last 20 years, things have really uh, taken off. And especially in the last year or two, the, the sort of public awareness of chat GPT has brought people to uh, begin to ask big questions about where are we going with this? So um, in the last five, 10 or more years, I've actually shifted a little bit to thinking more philosophically and theologically about this too, kind of realizing that my engineering education didn't really equip me to kind of think um to think well about these things, um, you know, how then shall we engineer is a question mm -hmm. that um, that requires a philosophical and theological background. So, so working at a Christian college, I had the opportunity to rub shoulders with theologians and uh, and uh, philosophers and social scientists and other thoughtful people, and um, and and began to try and think of ways that I could look at my discipline, but through the lens of uh, yeah, through the biblical story and through Christian philosophical thinking. It's so interesting, Derek. I'm, as you're talking, I just realized Calvin University now has, we've interviewed more professors from Calvin University than any other school. Yeah, together, probably anywhere else. Totally we've talked, coincidentally. We've talked, yeah, we've, we've talked Perhaps. to Jamie Smith, uh, as you were talking about. Your oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's I, a Calvinist joke. <laughs> I have some great uh, uh, colleagues here, actually. So so you, you, you could do worse elsewhere, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Kristen Dumay as well. So if you're mm -hmm. the, the third Calvin uh professor yes <clears throat> yeah so that's one of the reasons we want to talk to you we, there's tons of experts on ai specifically we could talk to you maybe we will in the future but you're one of the few who straddles the divide between uh, that and theology or at least trying to make the theological significance of artificial intelligence explicit um and so, is the key word there yeah <laughs> yeah so we're going to have some questions about that too but before we get to that let's just talk about the the straight science if we can for a bit just to get our listeners kind of on the same page about where things are i mean that is fundamentally the first question um, what is the current state of artificial intelligence what can it do right now um if you have a prediction for what you think it'll be able to do in the next five or ten years great um but also what can't it do because there's all sorts of stuff <laughs> going around about um you know from fears to ai taking over the world to is it uh, is it possibly intelligent right now? It seems like maybe it can already pass the Turing test. What does that mean? Um, what can and what can't it do? And where where are we? Yeah, I mean, in in broad broad strokes, artificial intelligence is the science of you know programming a computer to do something that would appear to be intelligent, right, to us. Um, and uh, and the field basically goes back to like the 1950s with pioneers like Marvin Minsky and Alan Turing and others who are ready at the beginning of the dawn of computing were sort of asking these questions. What can we do with a computational kind of engine and what can what, what is it possible in terms of mimicking sort of human intelligence? So that question goes goes way, way back in computer science. Um, 
And of course, it's only been in, and, and of course, there's been lots of research activity over the decades, things like neural nets that are sort of, um, you know, quite, quite common words nowadays, were, were, were being bantied around already in the 80s and the 90s. Mm-hmm. People have been exploring these different approaches to, to artificial intelligence. And machine learning is sort of where a lot of people um, have been focusing these days. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And then neural nets, um, um, sort of the the technology that's captured most people's attention and have come up with some startling sort of accomplishments in recent years, is sort of one um, one area of machine learning. So 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 the field is is quite broad, but it's the the sort of deep neural nets that have recently caused um, a lot of people to take notice because they've been able to do some quite remarkable things, right? Um, Back when I was in uh, grad school, if you had asked me, you know, would uh, would you ever be able to make a, an autonomous vehicle? I would have sort of laughed at you because the computer vision problem was just so big. Uh, back then, being able to sort of recognize objects uh, in an unstructured environment with highly variable lighting conditions and, you know, all kinds of unforeseen sort of um, uh, objects that you would encounter. Uh, just seemed like too big of a problem. And it just turns out that if you have a very large data set and you're able to create a neural, a deep neural network um, that with sufficient training and tuning and so on, these things are quite capable of doing some remarkable things. And so within 10 years of when I finished my my graduate work, people were already, you know, showing proof of concept of uh, of autonomous vehicles. And then image recognition. Um, we were in, we were doing work in computer vision, but a lot of these deep neural nets were doing really remarkable recognition rates on, you know, recognizing cats and, and images and these sorts of things, which, which is actually a fairly challenging uh, problem. And, uh, and then more recently, the large language models have really taken over people's attention. And most people have played around with chat GPT or heard about it. And and it is remarkable what these what these tools can do with uh, with the size of data set and uh, uh, the sort of way that the field has matured to this point that they're able to kind of do what they're able to do. Yeah. So a couple of terms you use there that I want to ask you to define um, machine learning, uh, deep learning. I, I'm not sure if you mentioned that one, but I wanted to ask you about it anyway. In neural- okay. Neural nets and also yeah. large language models. If you can define all of those terms, that'd be great. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll give sort of um broad strokes sort of uh, explanations of them. So so why don't we start with a, a neural net is basically an interconnection of nodes that are connected by weights where you can have certain inputs and the interconnection of these nodes basically multiply different values by different weights and then you get a number. So a number goes in and a number comes out. Hmm. And it turns out that if um uh, if you if you tune these things really really carefully and 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 um, and and in a strategic way, you can have inputs coming in that represent things like temperature and humidity, or perhaps brightness pixels on an image. And if you tune all these weights in this network accordingly, you could actually have an output that indicates, um, you know, whether or not a certain object is found in the image, or certain types of colors, or certain types of features. Um, and a deep neural network is basically taking that structure and just um, adding lots and lots and lots of layers to it so that there's lots and lots of different weights and nodes inside of this large network. And then its capabilities for, for uh, distinguishing and classifying things just, just, just grows. Um, machine learning um, doesn't necessarily have to use neural nets. Machine learning is the um, process by which you take a bunch of sample inputs and you train um, an algorithm or um, your program basically to classify those inputs. So you you basically take those inputs, you train a program to recognize them, and then you input new inputs that it hasn't seen before and you verify whether or not the the learning has been successful. And uh, machine learning back when I was doing graduate work was using things called principal component analysis and support vector machines, which are still used today. But the, the main way people do machine learning nowadays is using these neural networks. And they're called neural nets because they're kind of a, um, a simulation of the neurons in your brain, right? If you remember from, from basic biology, your, your, your brain is made up of a huge network of of nerve cells that have 
axions and dendrites, and they're all interconnected. And they basically, you know, send messages through to each other and they amplify them or attenuate them. And that's basically how your brain learns things. So that that the, the neural network is sort of biologically inspired by, by neurons in your head. And then as computing complexity really, really grew, the ability to put lots and lots and lots and lots of these weighted sort of nodes um, and networks into a computer became more and more plausible and, and possible. And, uh, and we began to discover that these things actually work quite well for doing lots of recognition tasks. Right. And so deep learning, where does that come in? Because that's what you're yeah, That's just more and more inner layers of these, the, these sort of weighted networks. Um, um, it just, it's just going and building these in a very large scale, uh, essentially. Okay. And there's like a recursive uh, aspect to it, right? About... Um... You're giving the thing a bunch of data and it's, um, I'm not even sure how to ask the question I want to ask, but there's a kind of like um, through lots and lots of iterative, yeah, it, it, it improves itself in a way. Can yes. you explain how that works? Yeah. So there, there's the, the, the algorithms typically referred to as back propagation, <clears throat> where you sort of put an input and then you look at the outputs. And uh, if they're not really classifying things correctly, you go back through all the different weights, you know, working backwards, you work through all the weights and adjust them such that the output um, is, is nudged in a more correct way. And you do this repeatedly over time until the sort of network converges and is able to have a, a, an acceptable recognition rate. So th 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 this is... This is a big algorithm that's used to sort of train it. And then once it's set up, you know, you the hope is you put new inputs into the device and it's seen enough training images mm -hmm. and the weights have been, you know, appropriately set such that you can now input new data and have it correctly classify things. Right. So I just listened to um, an interview with the head of DeepMind the other day, um, and he was talking about, this is Google's um, oh, yeah. AI, right? <clears throat> And so they were talking about, cause they, you know, very famously created an AI that could be the best Go player in the world. Um, the and that's what Go player. It's like the most complicated. It's kind of like a more complicated version of chess, uh -huh. basically yeah. super old game. I've never played it personally, but Alpha Go, I think they called it. Yeah. Yeah. Alpha Go is the name of the AI. Um, and so they got it to where based on what we've been talking about, essentially they got it to where it could be the best human players. And then they, kind of did a new thing and i don't know the details well enough go listen to this interview if you want to but um they they made a new one i think they called it alpha zero or something like that that could demolish the other one and it was essentially they told it nothing they mm -hmm. just um let it evolve um so the first one they had primed with all these rules and it had watched a bunch of human players and kind of picked up on the sorts of things that they were doing and so it was already primed to do what a good human player would do but with mm -hmm. the updated version having told it nothing, it figured out ways to play the game that no human had ever thought of. In fact, it would do things that human players thought were bad moves. And when you ask them, yeah. why do you think that was a bad move? They're like, that's what I was taught. And so we, we never did that. But the AI figured out a way to master that and then use it to destroy yeah. just human players, but the other AI. So how does something like that, where you don't give it a set of rules and you don't you know, train it on a ton of experience, you just kind of give it I don't even know how it works, but um, you let it evolve itself. How how does something like that come about? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. This is what sort of attracted me to machine learning back when I was doing my graduate work. So the, the sort of different ways of doing computer vision back then where you could either set up a camera and then meticulously sort of calibrate it and then come up with all the geometry, right, where you're projecting a 3D world onto a 2D image plane, do all the, you know, linear algebra and mathematics to determine you know, how things appear when they're projected onto a, um, uh, onto a CCD and, and sort of do all the math. Or, you know, if you use machine learning, you set up a camera. Uh, and in my case, we didn't even have to calibrate it. You just show it a bunch of images and you, you, you classify them. And then you allow the machine learning system to kind of learn what the appearance of something is. And then you show it new images and it's able to, to, to recognize things. It just seemed like a much more powerful way to solve a complex problem rather than going back to meticulously computing all of the geometry and ray tracing and all this sort of stuff. And, and, and that's what makes machine learning so attractive is that it, it can kind of um, find its way to a, to a good solution. 
And your your question about how does it do this? Well, it's 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 all math um, basically. So even in the case where you aren't giving it the rules and all this sort of stuff, there has to be some kind of goal function that you mm -hmm. need to define mathematically. So you need to mathematically define a goal of some kind, and then there are very elaborate algorithms that that do something that people refer to as steepest gradient descent. But basically, the idea is is that if you have a if you have a mathematical representation of sort of the space that you're working in, if you can find a way to try to optimize your, your goal function by moving in a direction, by tweaking weights and, and so on within the network so that you get closer to achieving your goal, which you need to define mathematically, right? So that, that would be whatever winning is, whatever constitutes winning, um, that over time, it'll, it, it'll basically find its way to, to, to minimizing that function. Now, there are there are challenges with that. Sometimes it finds a local minima. It doesn't find the maximum, the sort of the the the, the main minimum sort of uh, goal. Uh, but uh, sometimes it'll find sort of a local pool, a local minima. So these algorithms basically mathematically march in certain directions so that that goal function uh, gets minimized or maximized depending on how you express it. Uh, with each iteration until it sort of converges on on a reasonable solution. So the, the end effect is that you can, you know, without giving it any a priori information, as long as the goal function is clearly and robustly defined, you know, we, we you can see an AI begin to playing to, to begin playing games, right? You you see AIs playing games um, that have all kinds of complex kind of interactions, but over time, through training, they begin to discover um, mathematically by following this sort of steepest gradient descent to minimize that goal function. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and the results are quite remarkable. Um, so it's, it's all math under the hood. It's not conscious. It's not thinking about, you know, what do I need to do to make this better? It's just basically chugging through and trying to minimize a, a particular goal that has to be expressed, you know, mathematically. So can the you intelligence have... one? Okay. Yeah. So follow up and then we'll segue into that, hopefully. Okay. Um, so is one of the limitations then on building what they're calling an artificial general intelligence, which is something that cannot just do one specific type of thing, like be a human player at Go or, um, you know, write a clever essay like ChatGPT or something like that, or an apparently clever essay, right? But something that you can feed it novel problems or you can give it any any number of kinds of tasks and it can just figure out how to do them. Um, as far as I understand it, that's what an artificial general intelligence is. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. Is one of the limitations on building something like that from where we are that it would be very difficult to define a goal function for anything? <laughs> yeah, and and now we're getting into some more philosophical thinking. Um, not everything that counts can be counted. So one of the things about a computer is that it's it's sort of biased towards quantifiable information, stuff that can be computed. And so when we're thinking about, um, uh, and I was part of a conference just today where we were talking about ethics and virtue and AI, uh, when, when you begin thinking about um, different aspects of creation, like ethics and, and, uh, and virtue and aesthetics and these sorts of things and justice, can you boil those things down to goal functions or to, can you express them numerically? Can you express them mathematically? And and I would say that um, <clears throat> to, to say that you can presupposes a very reductionistic way of looking at, at creation, essentially. Um, I think one of the starting points that I have as a Christian computer scientist is that um, the world is complex and diverse, and there are certain things that are irreducible. Now, it turns out that, um, you know, the numeric sort of sort of data in the world is very powerful. We can learn a lot of things about the world through data and through numerical analysis and through computation, but it doesn't capture all of reality. We can't reduce all of created reality to numbers and data. Um, I'm, I'm a little suspicious of that. I think maybe we can. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, let's put it this way. You know, you, you, the three of us are having a conversation. There's all kinds of numbers going on, right? There's three of us in conversation. Every single pixel uh, and sound value that's going back and forth can be quantified, right? So my, my voice waveform has a particular shape that could be quantified with different magnitudes over time. Each of the, I'm looking at you on, on the screen here, and there's 
rows and columns of pixels that all have brightness values and red and green and blue components. So all of that can, there's, there's all kinds of numeric aspects to what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. but the essence of what we're doing, you know, the, um, the, the, the sort of uh, philosophical thinking, the sort of relational kind of exchange back and forth, the, um, the, 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 the social sort of aspects there, they can't be reduced to just numbers that there's more going on than just, than just, the sort of numeric right. part of what we're doing. Yeah, but can they be reduced to some kind of processing of information that, um, you know, numbers might sound too sim simplistic, but if you believe, as I do, that um, in some way that we don't even come close to understanding, the brain is fundamentally mm -hmm. an information processor, and it is somehow creating this experience that we're having in inclusive of the logical aspects of it and um, the emotional aspects of it and the experiential mm -hmm. aspects of it, maybe even the conscious aspects of it, that gets a little tricky. But um, mm -hmm. if we could figure out a way, which everybody's trying to do, of actually simulating brain activity, now we mm -hmm. should say, hopefully you will uh, agree with this, computers are simply nowhere close to that and not really even doing anything very much like what the brain is doing. Not only that, we don't really know what the brain is doing. So we're like not even kind yeah. of approaching that. We're yes. centuries away, maybe, from from that. Um, but if we could, <laughs> and it seems like maybe the only thing holding us back is it's not like some fundamental possibility barrier or something. It's just, maybe it's just processing power. That's what all the, the, you know, people like deep mind seem to think, um, maybe it's more than that, but if we could get the right tools and we could have the right amount of information, maybe we could replicate something like a human brain. And if we could, um, maybe we could do the thing that all everybody seems to be aiming for, which is create a thing that from, for all intents and purposes is indistinguishable from our perspective, from what we're doing. Now it's mm -hmm. a different thing to say. It's actually conscious. It's having an experience, right. actually intelligent. That's, that's a separate issue. But you know, if we follow Turing here, we might conceivably be able from where we are now to create a thing that you or I could not tell the difference <laughs> between that. Yeah, I, I think uh, so. So I think that's why Christians need to be conscious of ontology, right? You know, what does it mean to be an anthropology? What does it mean to be a human? Um, but I think the the technology uh, and AI in particular is is moving at such a pace, and the computational sort of power and and um, and and some of the the, the you know, data sets that we have are, are so powerful that I think that we'll be able to build machines that'll be able to fool most of the people most of the time in terms of interacting with them. You know, I think the Turing test will will easily be passed, but that does not mean that we have built a human, um, right? We, we so just most built... of the worries that I've encountered anyway, and I'm very much a novice on this issue, um, most of the worries though that I encounter amongst experts in included and, mm. uh, you know, AI companies like what's the one that broke off um, it's Anthropic or something like that? It broke off from a larger one specifically because they didn't think they were taking the threat seriously enough and, and sort yeah. of themselves according to that. Um, and so you've got, you know, people like Nick Bostrom and whoever who are really worried not so much about creating a sentient thing, but creating a thing that gets out of control and destroys us all by doing essentially what it was designed to do. Is that sort of super intelligence they call it? Is that something that worries you? And if not, why not? Yeah, I'm I'm not as worried about that. Um, I, I I wouldn't be so bold as to say that can't happen. I mean, um, if anything, I think our science fiction sort of movies are great thought experiments about all the ways things can go wrong when we make poor choices and design decisions, right? Aren't we? Um, the Frankenstein narrative is uh, is basically very alive and well in, in much of our science fiction uh, movies. And I think in many ways, the artists kind of get there first. They sort of ask this question, right, about, uh, well, what, what what was it that one uh, science fiction author wrote once? That the, the job of a science fiction author is not to uh, imagine the car, but to imagine the traffic jam, right? So so to think about sort of the implications of these things. So I'm, I'm not as worried about the existential threat um, you know, I think I think it makes for for a fascinating sort of narrative and and um, interesting discussion. Um, but I'm more worried about more you know kind of garden variety threats like um, you know injustice, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> deploying you know um, 
deploying algorithms and, and AI for determining who gets a loan and who gets parole from a prison and who gets a job and who gets a raise and who gets audited and like, like all these sorts of things that can be easily automated by machines, who gets insurance. Um, and so uh, these sort of things, I think, have already proven to be highly problematic, right? The bias and um, injustice that have been propagated by some of these things. One um, very, very popular writer is Kathy O'Neill. She wrote this, this book titled Weapons of Math Destruction. And she, she highlights already today how data science and people working with big data and AI are, are throwing these sort of tools at all kinds of uh, problems to automate things, to make them more efficient, but in the process are introducing all kinds of injustice and, and, and so on. So I'm more worried about those sorts of things rather than, you know, the, the sort of Skynet Terminator scenario. Um, and so, and I think those are the ones that, um, that are ones that we need to grapple with like right now. Um, and, uh, so, so I, you know, in terms of threats, I'm I'm less conscious of or less um, worried about the the Skynet scenario. And when you talk about injustice, you're talking about humans who are who have an inherent sense of bias who are program programming that into computers. Then is that what we're talking about? Yeah, it's more the data sets. Um, you know, there, there's sometimes you know sometimes humans can be creating these systems. But naively doing so by by using data sets to train artificial intelligence. So so here's one sort of really simple example. Let's say you want to create an AI to help with hiring, right? For for human resources. So you take the data set of all your existing employees that do a really good job. You use that to train for what you should be looking at in resumes of people who are applying. But what happens if your existing workforce is mostly white, mostly trained in Ivy League schools, mostly people over fifty? Then you know the, these the, the AI will pick up on the historical bias and patterns that are already present in your company, and then perpetuate them in terms of hiring into the future. Um, and AI is very good at pattern matching. So so even when you take out things like race and so on, they be, you know these systems can zoom in on things like zip code and other things that can be a proxy for race or for social class or or other things. So. Um, so yeah, the, the issue of, of bias isn't so much, you know, evil programmers putting bias into the code. It's more naive programmers who are just trying to solve a problem technically without thinking about all of the implications that they should be thinking about. And are other people having these conversations? I'm assuming so. Yeah, no, I, I think the one thing that's heartening is to see the sort of discipline sort of becoming aware of how how much responsibility we have when we start deploying some of these systems. And so the, the, these the, these conversations are happening far and wide. Unfortunately, I think, you know, in, in sort of the corporate environment, there's often a race to kind of get your product out there. And there's sort of financial pressures and, and others that I think make it more difficult uh, uh, for people working in those contexts. But um, um, among sort of academics, especially, I think that the issues of of, uh, of bias and justice in data science and, and artificial intelligence is is a theme that you hear quite frequently. Mm -hmm. So I want to take <clears throat> take the conversation to a more spiritual, clearly spiritual uh, direction mm -hmm. or theological. You've written about the possibilities of AI deities that could be created and people who are right now working on creating an AI godhead that would work for good in the world. How that sounds crazy to me, but also <laughs> not crazy. Um, how prevalent do you think these cocktails of technology and spirituality will get? And how do you think this will shape our ideas of the divine? Yeah, that that's a really interesting question. So the the, the piece that I did write about was about Anthony Lewandowski, mm -hmm. who was um, an AI practitioner and a, a very clever programmer who actually wanted to start a church of AI. Now, this is since from what I understand, been disbanded and so on, and, and people have moved on. But there was this impulse to kind of see AI as this sort of super intelligence that was going to basically um, far exceed human capacities. And people's response was uh, religious, right? And, um, and, and you see this in, in, in a lot of different ways, you know, whether people are talking about fear or whether they're talking about sort of utopian dreams, um, you know, they see technology as either the savior or the villain. And uh, and and I think, you know, 
The one thing that the Bible teaches us is that there's nothing in creation that's either the savior or the villain, right? I mean, um, redemption comes through Christ and the problem is sin. But yeah, sin sin has this impact in, in all of our cultural activities. So um so yeah, I see a lot of um a lot of sort of religious sort of language when people talk about, you know, on the utopian side, you know, ushering in an era where AI will cure every disease and sort of wipe away every tear. It's almost, you know, biblical language that they're using when they talk about how how AI might solve every problem. A yep. well-known yep. um um uh computer scientist named Mark Andreessen, he was part of the early internet sort of uh, web development. Uh, wrote an article recently called AI Will Save the World. Um, and it, it's basically an eschatological vision of technology solving a lot of humankind's most fundamental problems. Um, and I think it's religious at its core. And, I, and I'm not surprised because I think at our essence, we are all religious, right? We all have, we, we were created for God. And, uh, you know, in the words of Augustine, right, and we have this God-sized hole and our hearts remain restless until we rest in him. And we're looking for all kinds of other ways to fill that. Um, and for some people, it's it's technology. Mm -hmm. So you just mentioned, go ahead, do you have a follow-up? I was just going to ask you to expand on which specific part of that you think is religious, because obviously, if, you know, you have a cult that wants to worship an AI, that's clearly religious. But if it's just yeah. like, you know based on the evidence that I see currently and the trajectory and the speed of progress, yeah. I can imagine a few, a not too distant future where AI has done something like, you know, cured all the diseases or, um, you know, done something like eliminated inequality, something like that. Right. Um, and I can feel really happy and confident and optimistic about that without being religious. So like, where does the religious aspect of it come in? Yeah, I think, you know, when 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 you get a chance to talk to folks, you realize that they're animated by some kind of narrative, right? And and you know, the Bible has this creation, fall, redemption narrative. And what I find so remarkable is that when I look at some of the different views and you sort of scratch away at the surface, you see they basically replace the biblical story with another kind of narrative, right? So so basically what's the problem with the world and what's the remedy, right? Um and and different I don't know, religious stories, I would call them, or different meta narratives will answer the questions about, you know, what's wrong with the world and what's the remedy and where does redemption come from and what's the nature of what it means to be human. There's all presuppositions that everyone holds about these sorts of things. And and I would say that they function as as a kind of religious vision of the world, a worldview. Um, um, and, and you see them in different ideologies, you see them in certain um um narratives about how things are shaped and and i think at their core they're fundamentally religious now i think people would probably push back on the word religious that that, that word is more more loaded now perhaps but um in terms of a worldview, in terms of um commitments that people have a, the, a narrative that people have i think that that all of these different views have have got some kind of narrative behind them and um and when it comes to AI, I think we need to ask the question, you know, what what story are we a part of? Um, I like to quote Alistair McIntyre, right? He's this great philosopher of ethics. And, and he once wrote, you know, we can't answer the question, what ought we to do until we answer the prior question of what story are we a part? You know, and what story are we a part? Of? And so um, I think if you begin with that, then you can begin to think about what is it, what does responsible action look like in technology or in this field or in this area based on the story in which I'm living? I think I disagree with Alistair. <laughs> that would be a much longer okay. conversation. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah that comes from his book. Uh, <laughs> that comes from his book After Virtue, yeah, which, which I think is a, a, a <laughs> book. But yeah, not everyone would sign up to that. So I allow see. the the least educated person in this conversation to ask some sixth grade questions <laughs> that everyone wants to know. Um, well, oh, I wouldn't say least educated, differently educated, right? You're a theologian. So I'm you're, you're, I'm you're least looking at it for sure, but I'm not a theologian. <laughs> um, however, here's, here's some, here's a couple of simple questions. How close or far into the future do you think is AI from being able to cure all sorts of diseases that we've dreamt about curing for decades? Yeah, that I mean, it's already doing it in some ways, like, you know, um, drug discovery, um, AI is able to search massive spaces, there, there's programs, uh, 
uh, there's a program called Alpha Fold, where you just have massive supercomputers that are just chugging away, looking for ways to 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 sort of have proteins interact, and um, and and these sorts of programs and these sort of capabilities uh, allow us to sort of explore sort of the, these spaces in ways that just you know as as humans we we couldn't imagine or. Or, or 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 plausibly do right? It would be intractable for us to kind of search all, all of these things. So already, you know, and then I think uh, AI has a lot of um, beneficial applications in medicine, where you know you, you can use artificial intelligence to 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 look at uh, medical images. Um, I was looking the other day at you know someone's trying to develop an app where you can kind of look at um, um, you know skin skin marks and sort of have them kind of flagged or not, you know, there's um, AI for the environment, you know, um, so looking at sort of environmental issues that can impact health. Um, uh, I think that that AI now curing every disease, I think that's only going to happen when we enter the new heavens and the new earth. So so my my eschatology is that uh, the new heaven and the, the new earth, the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. It isn't subcontracted to humans. But I do think that through the blessing of technology, we're able to uh, use that to push back uh, some of the effects of the fall and through technology rightly directed, be able to show love for our neighbor and to, uh, yeah, help overcome, you know, some of the some of the struggles that we face, including including some of the health ones. So I'm I'm optimistic. I think that's a good area for AI. I think that that that's an area where where investment, I think, is is um where, where it's i think uh, not only something that we um can do it's something we ought to do mm -hmm. so we are affected by you know this i this word cancer people yeah. in the conversation are affected by this listeners are affected by it Let, i just want to add like are we decades away from curing cancer? Are we more than a century away? Is that not even possible with what you see now? Like how fast are these technologies developing? How far out are we looking at something outstanding and crazy like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, that, yeah. I mean, it's Yogi Berra who said once, right? It's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, uh, um, and I'm not in medicine and I'm, I'm not a doctor. And I've heard it once said that cancer isn't one disease, it's many diseases. Um, but um, but I, I'm hopeful. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that AI will 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 allow us to work better towards better treatments and perhaps even some cures in many cancers. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, I it, it's hard to predict, but I think I would be reluctant to say it will cure all cancers. But um, but yeah. I hope so. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> um, a couple more quick questions. Uh, in one of your articles you referenced, is it Ray Kurzweil? Yeah, probably. I like to quote Ray Kurzweil. Um, he said that he believes humans will be able to upload our brains into a computer and live forever within this century. And this idea of cult is called the rapture of the geeks. <laughs> How do you think of that? Of this, yeah. uh, thing well, that and do you think that's a real possibility? Yeah, actually, I think the title Rapture of the Geeks, I saw in an IEEE Spectrum magazine. So the IEEE is this huge technical organization, and they actually had an article called The Rapture of the Geeks. And it shows you the sort of religious underpinnings of some of these views, right? I mean, there's certain presuppositions that you have to have about what it means to be human, to even consider the possibility that one could upload their brain into a computer and live forever. Um, and, and I think you know, my sense is that's a highly reductionistic view of what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And I think death will only be, um, uh, death will only be um, basically ended when Christ returns. But, um, uh, but, you know, Ray Kurzweil is a very clever guy. He worked at, you know, MIT and he's got all kinds of inventions under his belt and he's director of engineering at Google right now. Um, but, you know, he's taking all kinds of vitamins each day, trying to preserve his health and his body so that, you know, once the technology advances sufficiently, he'll be able to upload his brain and, and, and avoid death. Um, and, and, um, and so, you know, I, I think from a Christian anthropology sort of standpoint, we're, we're, you know, the, 
we would say that we're much, much more than the electrochemical reactions in our brain. I mean, if, if you presuppose sort of physicalism that all we are can be completely captured by the electrochemical reactions in our brain, and we can simulate those with high fidelity on a computer, then if you hold that presupposition, then 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 I grant that, you know, that that could be a possibility. But I think being human is is much, much more than the electrochemical reactions in our brain. And, you know, from the Christian story and creation we see already, right, with uh, with Adam, that he was made out of the dust of the earth, but also the breath of the Lord, you know, the the dry bones and the vision of Elijah, they were all put back together into bodies, but it still required the breath of the Lord. There's this um, this spirit as well as body. So um, uh, we're, we're, our, our sort of anthropology is much more complex than a bunch of uh, than, than a bunch of atoms and molecules. Um, there's much more to us than that. I, I think of the, the words of Psalm 115 when I think of that, that vision of downloading a brain into a computer, you know, where Psalm 115 says that those who trust in idols will become like them. Hmm. And I think that's exactly what will happen. When you download your brain into a computer, you'll basically become a computer. Um, so I mean, It um, sounds like we're, ha we're having a conversation in a sci-fi movie. This is ridiculous. <laughs> um, yeah. But I was also tempted to make a joke about the idea of downloading your brain into a computer and living forever in a computer and eternal conscious torment being about the same thing, but I won't. <laughs> Very much depends on the software. <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, last quick question or last kind of like sixth grader. Will this ever happen? Um, <laughs> the idea of AI humans um, and AI humans becoming a thing. Do you think that's a, I mean, I've already watched, you know, commercials of organizations right now trying to make that happen and they're in the infancy stages and it's all, all full of all sorts of glitches but it seems like we're headed that way would you agree with that or do you think we're going to push pause before that happens or what does that look like you mean so creating ai so that it looks just like a human or or exactly. and yeah do you like a human and you go to the doctor and it's not a doctor but it's a you know physician yeah. assistant that's actually a robot I, I think that impulse is there. I mean, you see people trying to create machines in our own image all the time. Um, and, and, and I find that problematic. I, you know, I think I, I'm, I'm all for using AI to help with medicine and with, uh, you know, climate change and with um, environmental monitoring and um, designing safer cities and all, all these sort of good applications. But trying to build a person um, I, I think just leads to ontological confusion. Um, you know, I, I think machines are machines and people are people and neither are God. And, and I think trying to build a machine that looks or sounds like a person is actually problematic. I mean, when, when, um, when, when, when you talk to Siri and it, it uses the first person pronoun, um, it, it's pretending to be a person, right? But it's not. It, it, and I think a person who's written really well about this, a thoughtful social scientist is Sherry Turkle, right? Her books Alone Together and Reclaiming Conversation and so on um, ha, has kind of engaged the things of ro robotic partners. I mean, sex bots are a thing now. People, people are um, developing sex bots. And I think a relationship between you and an AI robot or, or even if it's disembodied, like the movie Her, right? You and an AI entity of some kind is a relationship essentially of one person. Um, and, uh, and and I think that's problematic for people. Sort of empathy and mutuality uh, require interacting with, with other real people. But I think this impulse is is going to be there. I see researchers just trying to trying to build robots that look more and more like us. And, and my inclination is, you know, build robots and and build AI, but 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 don't try to fool people by making them look like real people because they're not, right? So if you're going to build a machine that washes dishes, don't build a humanoid robot. Build a big box where you can put dishes in, and then it washes them. Right? It looks more like a dishwasher than a person, right? If you're going to build, um, you know, a robot to help with nursing. Don't replace nurses with robots. Have the sort of caring, empathetic human touch, but build machines that can help with lifting people and, and doing some of these really more difficult and challenging tasks. And they may not, these robots may not look like people at all. They may just look like machines for doing those tasks. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's problematic. Um, and uh, my, my, 
my preference would be not to have all kinds of machines looking like people and preserving right. the uniqueness and distinctiveness of what it means to be human. As you talk, I feel like I can hear, like, like that's a losing argument already. Like, wouldn't you rather be <laughs> in a bed in a hospital by someone who feels and looks and mm, exactly and that's like where, a human being? Than a that's machine? where it's going to start, right? right? I was recently watching a conversation between Dan Dennett and David Chalmers, a couple of very famous philosophers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what they were talking about. Like, this is going to start in nursing homes, essentially. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Dan Dennett, interestingly, I thought of him while you were talking because I think he would agree with everything you said, but for like almost opposite reasons or, or you would come <laughs> to some different places. But he's very concerned about, you know, counterfeit people and deep fakes and stuff yeah. like that. as a militant atheist, you, we can we can agree about some of that stuff, regardless of our religious assumptions. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So, I, I tell my students when I get old and gray, don't put me in an old age home. I don't want to be in an old age home with with robots. I want real people to come and see me. And but of course, you'd also, I would assume. I don't know. I'm re reading into this. I would want. I would prefer, you know, a human like robot to no one. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, yeah. maybe the option is more more likely than not yeah. loneliness or a robot rather than family or a robot, unfortunately. The, I think the impulse there is to try and try and find an efficient technical solution for a problem. Right. And if that's where you're coming from, I mean, this is what Jack Galal wrote about. Right. He, he, he called it technique. Right. Absolute efficiency for everything. And, and if human care is a problem that needs to be solved, then there's an efficient way to do it by just building machines that can provide that. And, and I think um, I, I think that we need to ask ourselves, what are the jobs that we need? We, we want to be done by people where care and compassion and wisdom are required that we don't want to offload to machines. And what can we do to make sure that we value those kinds of jobs and reward them and, and, um, and give people their due for, for sort of doing those things and, 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 and ourselves, you know, making sure we care for the own people, the, you know, our own people in our life. So, um, yeah, and Sherry Turkle's written a lot about that, um, about that as well, and and I'm very sympathetic to, to to her her thoughts on that as well. Yeah, let's keep AI tools and stop trying to turn them into people. Um, yeah. Did you have a follow up? I was going to ask another. Okay. Um. So I did want to ask you. So what is? Let me see if I can phrase this uh, in a clear way. So there's what you were describing earlier as religious motivations. I might just mm -hmm. call a lot of that ethical okay I, i'm fine with using religion in a very broad way and i think most people are religious in some sense without realizing it i also like to respect people when they tell me they're not religious <laughs> so um but, right. but let's say um i think a lot of what you're describing as a religious motivation can also possibly be described as an ethical motivation and and so one of the things that i think about a lot is what about christianity is distinctive and by that i mean can't be reduced to just some ethical thing that you could get in lots and lots of other ways now i do think christianity offers um ethical insights and so i don't want to say it doesn't have any distinctive ethical insights but um i would want to class those somewhat separately than the specifically religious stuff maybe you wouldn't mm -hmm. and so maybe we could you know disagree about that but you seem to think that Christianity particularly has some insight to offer about things like technology and artificial intelligence. I can definitely see how there are ethical considerations and, and what little I've read and heard from you, I hear a lot of ethical considerations and maybe Christians have some interesting insights into those ethical considerations, but like, you know, qua Christian, what, what do I have or what does any Christian uh, or does the Bible, I guess, or any Christian tradition have to say to technology beyond just let's be good people in X, Y, Z ways? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Um, I, I think I would I would quibble a little bit with the notion that ethics and religion are sort of interchangeable. Ethics is sort of, you know, what right action looks like in the world. You know, if, if you define it as that, then then there needs to be certain presuppositions about you know, what does it mean to be human and what is the nature of the world and these sorts of things and and th those are those are what i would call the religious presuppositions or the worldview presuppositions or the ideological presuppositions um and so i think ethics does have sort of a prior um thing and actually we, we encounter this in in engineering i was um I was part of a, a panel discussion with the uh, with uh, the ACM, which is a large 
um, uh, computing organization about technology and values, ethics and values. And so we talk a lot about ethics. So oftentimes, you know, in the computing profession, we're talking about ethics. We need more ethics and students, CS students, computer science students need to be taught ethics. But I said, you know, what, what, what comes before ethics? If you're going to say these are the sort of rules that we need to live by, they presuppose certain things uh, about what is to be valued, about what it means to be human. And, um, and actually, one of the people who wrote the, the, the ACM Code of Ethics, which a lot of computer scientists learn and are aware of, actually came up to me sort of privately afterwards. And he said, well, actually, those ethics are based on Judeo-Christian values, but we don't really say that. <laughs> um, and um, I found that kind of interesting. But, but the truth is, is how do we agree what to do when we all come from different stories, different narratives? And... Um, you know, and I, I think the Christian story is just really compelling. I, I mean, I'm a Christian, so so perhaps that's obvious, but I think in a lot of ways it out narrates a lot of other stories. Um, but I think one of the things that we're called to do, and one of the things that I try to do, is work uh, from a from a position of principal pluralism, right? Where we're working in the world, but we're we're working alongside people that are all sort of working with different stories. And we're trying to find common cause, right? Building AI that's going to do good and so on and trying to work together uh, towards that. Um, and what's amazing is that even though some people have different religious presuppositions or ideologies, um, we can find some common agreement. I mean, that that's sort of how work happens in the public square. Um, I think that's how things have to happen in the boardroom. I, I tell my students too, when you go off to Silicon Valley, you can't stand up in the boardroom and say, thus saith the Lord, and then sort of, you know, give your sort of, you know, take on what things should be. You got to work together with people and you got to build relationships with them. And, you know, you, your faith, of course, is animating you behind the scenes, but you're you're looking for common cause uh, to collaborate. So um, I'm not sure if that completely addresses your question, but that's that's sort of where my mind goes uh, when we talk about ethics and religious sure. presupposition. No, no, that's helpful to put it in a very crude way. So let's say we were to have, you know, a panel discussion about artificial intelligence or technological advancements or whatever, um, and we wanted a bunch of experts on the panel. And so we get, you know, an engineer and we get somebody who, you know, specializes in whatever kind of AI we're talking about. And we get a anthropologist and we get a psychologist and we get a sociologist and we get a, I don't know, you know, we fill out the panel, right? With philosopher. With, we need a philosopher. Maybe, yeah. Maybe we have a philosopher of mind or something. <clears throat> Do yes. we need a pastor on the panel? I hope you say yes. And we have an ethicist. <laughs> <our one of those. laughs> so, so I'm part of an actual organization called AI and faith. And it's actually an interfaith group. So we're, we're having conversations with people from Muslim tradition and from the Jewish traditions, Christian tradition, from other world religions. And um, and, and all of these world religions have, uh, have different insights that are formed by their beliefs. Um, but it's quite fruitful to have those sorts of conversations because you find that there are a lot of things um, of common cause that you can come together with. And I mean, we, we need to do this in the public square. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, I think it'd be helpful to have a theologian uh, on, on that kind of panel. Um, you know, the, the the Christian religion and other other religions have, you know, some of them thousands of years of social thought um, and wisdom that's inside of that. And uh, and I like to think that two thousand years of Christian social thought has something to say about you know this this moment, um, especially since I think most AI questions have to start with the question, what does it mean to be human? And then your sort of decisions about how you proceed sort of flow from a certain instinct about those sorts of questions. And philosophers and theologians can can bring can bring wisdom from those traditions and from from other things. I certainly hope there's not only computer scientists on that panel. Mm -hmm. I mean, heaven help us if it's only computer scientists design. I mean, I'm a computer scientist, so I, I know we, we need the help of social scientists and philosophers and people in the humanities and and, and so on, because uh, because these are complex problems. These are cultural things, not just technical problems. So if we could do a little more quick fire, Cubes, I've got okay, there's more questions. Some more. <laughs> well, no, no, there's just more questions okay. that, that I'd like to get to. And I don't want to keep, I know you've been Zooming all day, Derek, but. Um, yes, I have. 
my my <laughs> my imagination in these conversations has been inspired by Hollywood. I feel like we're close to living in Westworld or the Matrix. <laughs> And then I think about the Avengers and the, the the wrong guy getting his hands on the Tony Stark's equipment and all hell breaks loose, you know, but I think a lot of us are scared about that, about that possibility. Stephen Hawking said the development of full art artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Elon Musk, before he was like the, you know, technological bad, bad guy, called AI our greatest existential threat. Um, humans have created and used technology for, for tremendous good and really profound evil what are your thoughts on people how concerned are you with bad people doing using ai in war or in any kind of unimaginable evil to bring an apocalyptic end or or something just short of that yeah no i i, I think this is a real possibility right that that you know bad actors can get a hold of powerful tools and technology basically amplifies our human ability to do good and evil and so, and so, bad actors uh, getting getting a hold of powerful tools can lead to bad consequences, right? And and so, thinking about people with no scruples using AI in warfare, uh, or using AI for any number of different things that you can you can perhaps imagine. Um, so yeah, I, I I think that that's real, um, and I think that's why you know we need to be vigilant. I think that's why some kind of AI regulation uh, might be helpful. Um, you know, regulations is a bit of a, a dirty word, but in other technologies like automobiles and aviation, we have, you know, federal jurisdictions that sort of watch over those things. The Food oh. and Drug Association. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, right. Yeah. Not... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You, you missed a joke about gun <laughs> regulation that I just dropped in there, Derek. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Canadian, actually, and I've learned never to bring up guns. You know, <laughs> so, you know, That's a smart, smart idea. I just avoid that altogether. So, um but um, but yeah, you know, I, I think I think there's a, there's a role for that, and and maybe some kind of world consensus about uh, just like you'd have the Geneva Convention, we'd have certain conventions about how AI ought or ought not to be used. You know, um, the Christian tradition has a lot of insights from just war theory, right, from uh, Saint Augustine, that can help inform how how AI ought to be used in in warfare. Um, in the whole area of lethal autonomous robots and so on as a whole other area that could take up a whole episode. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm worried because, um, um, because sin is real and, and people who are armed with powerful tools can, can, can wreak more havoc. Um, but, you know, I think that AI, as we mentioned, also has all these other wonderful possibilities. And so the question is, how do we develop it responsibly? And, um, uh, and yeah, and adding regulations in order to safeguard and provide guardrails for for its use. Yeah, the thing that as as I've as I was putting questions together, the thing that encouraged me is the reality that we've had our hands, and by we I mean humanity, has had our hands mm -hmm. on nuclear weapons for about eighty years, almost a century. Yeah, now. and we are the only nation to ever you know use them in war. That's an encouraging thing to me. Um, not that we we've used them, but that only twice has an atomic bomb or nuclear bomb been dropped in the world. It's had taken a lot of work, right? There's a lot of bilateral yeah. work that has to be done. A lot of regulations, like you're saying, a lot of agreements. They're still in our yeah. trying to keep nuclear weapons out of crazy people in new Northern North Korea and in Iran, all that stuff. But it encourages me that we've been able to like not blow up the whole world with nuclear weapons. It seems to me that like the next administration should have a new cabinet position that is all about AI and technology and regulations or whatever. I mean, how is it that imminent as it feels to me? I, I, I think so. And I think, um, you know, at the UN level as well, that nation states begin to talk about, you know, how are we going to regulate this stuff or make agreements that there's certain lines that we're not going to cross. The EU already has regulations about AI. They're usually ahead on this stuff, data privacy and other areas the EU tends to lead. And I, their legislation is interesting because the, one of the ways they lay it out is to say there are some things we're just going to outright um, uh, outlaw. We're just going to say these are not things that we want to do as a society. This is not where we want to go. Um, 
And uh, and yeah, I think I, I could see that that's that's where we're going. Your mention of the atomic bomb made me think of the new Oppenheimer movie, and I haven't seen it yet, but I'm I'm really sort of eager. Oh, to I was see thinking it. about it the whole time you've been yeah. talking about this. I yeah. saw it the other day. I won't give it. Oh, well, you did. I mean, there's this wonderful, uh, not wonderful, but disturbing quote that Opp that's attributed to Oppenheimer. Right? He said something like, "When you see something technically sweet." you go ahead and you do it and then you figure yeah. out the consequences yeah. afterwards right that specific um, quote didn't make it into the film but something uh, similar did and there's an extended scene i won't give too much away but there's an extended scene that we have transcripts for and so a lot of what's being said on screen was actually said um yeah. and essentially they're asking him why did you change your mind from being obviously head of the manhattan project to being kind of an activist against at yeah. least hydrogen bombs not particular atomic bombs but hydrogen weapons and kind of the answer he gets to is when I realized if we have a weapon, we'll use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that's concerning if he's right about yeah. human and nature. It's, I mean, it's a timely movie in the sense that we have these these sort of powerful technologies that 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 also do you know have the possibility of doing great harm, and so we we need to ask those questions again uh, about about what we're doing and. Uh, you know the, the the quote about doing something technically sweet. You know when you see something technically sweet, you do it. Is kind of the Silicon Valley narrative, right? Move quickly and break things, right? And then figure it out later on. Um, is not a really way, not a really good way to love your neighbor or to build a society. Actually, um, you know I'm, I'm not against innovation, but but I think that there are responsible ways to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe just one more okay and then we can be done with us <laughs> <That's very laughs> okay yeah um so we've talked about the evils the potential evils that most people are concerned about in terms of ai but there's also the potential the optimistic side right so i'm, I'm an optimist at heart i'm a huge star trek buff i, I have really high hopes for human future and technology um and so maybe it'll all go great. <laughs> and maybe, you know, maybe it's not going to be a thing that's to be worshipped or anything like that, but maybe it'll just be a really great tool or lots of really great tools and human life in a hundred or 200 years will be unrecognizable, much like human life now would have been unrecognizable 200 years ago, but possibly exponentially more so. Do you see anything religiously concerning about that possibility? Because I look at it and I think that's wonderful and I feel no con conflict with my religious or spiritual sensibilities whatsoever. But based on our conversation, I'm wondering if you might. Well, th th this this question reminds me of sort of historical examples. So when when, when electricity was was invented, you know, um, uh, Tesla, who was one of the pioneers in, in exploring technical power, he made these predictions uh, about how electricity in, in the city will annihilate diseases and people will be safe and they'll be, um, you know, it'll be impossible to be hurt in the city. He made all these sort of bold predictions. If you go back to the telegraph, uh, when the telegraph cables were first sort of laid across the, uh, the oceans, people made predictions that wars will never happen anymore. There'll be no more misunderstandings once we're able to communicate with each other. People were, were saying things like we're going to turn our muskets into candlestick, candlestick holders, right? So uh, there, there was these sort of sort of really, really broad sort of proclamations that we're going to usher in a new era of um, peace and prosperity. And actually, when the early Internet was starting to be developed as well, when the web started to to emerge, there was bold predictions about, you know, how this sort of worldwide knowledge would 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 lead to peace and understanding and and uh, the lack of uh, or sort of the the end of ignorance and and all this sort of stuff um you know there was even a, an effort at MIT to sort of give every child in the world a laptop and they would just drop them by helicopters and child they come back and they, they would expect to see children would have overcome all kinds of problems so so that it's a kind of technicism technicism is the the idea that a trust in the progress of technology to solve all of our problems. So, so, so when I hear predictions of AI ushering in a new age, um, I, I sort of, my sort of Christian instincts are to avoid this sort of, um, um, you know, basically avoid idolatry, sort of seeing seeing technology as the solution to sort of our our human problems. And and uh, and like I said, there's this historical sort of record of every time new technology comes along, people making quite bold proclamations. 
But that being said, you know, new technologies do come with a lot of benefits. I love electricity um, and what it does for us. It hasn't, you know, it hasn't put an end to sin and and all that sort of stuff, but it does does make um, doing podcasts at 10 p.m. at night a lot easier. And uh, <laughs> and and I think AI will bring uh, some remarkable developments in, in in human society and culture. But I think that the, the the, the 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 sort of challenge for each generation is is not to turn anything into to replace the creator with anything in creation right and turn it into an idol so so even as these things do are capable of remarkable things and as we see remarkable accomplishments unfold um that we that we continue to place our trust in god that's sort of my christian instincts and be thankful to him for technology technology is part of the uh, I've written elsewhere the latent potentials in creation. God built a creation with the possibilities for AI and technology, and our calling and our responsibility is to unfold that and use it in ways that love our neighbor and care for the earth. That's that's how we ought to be doing it. So, yeah, that's just some of my thoughts. Good, good. Thank you, Derek. Um, you've written a number of books that our listeners, I think, would be very interested in. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of those books that uh, our listeners can find? We'll have links in the show notes to to be able to go to these books. But what are some books that we can dive into? Yeah, so the last two are, are probably the ones that I, you know, that that might be of interest. The more recently, last year, there was a book called The Christian Field Guide to Technology for Engineers and Designers. And it's, um, you know, it'll probably appeal to lots of people, but it's specifically written for people working in technology and engineering um, and looking at sort of all of that through a Christian lens. And then um, uh, my other book is called Shaping a Digital World, Faith, Culture, and Computer Technology. And uh, and both of those books were published by InterVarsity Academic Press. Awesome. Again, yeah. we'll have we'll have links in our show notes. Um, Derek, thank you so much for staying up late with us tonight. And thanks for, for just sharing yourself with us. It's a fascinating conversation that we could have a three, four, five more of these, um, but we're, and we're just scratching the surface. So thanks for doing that with us tonight, Derek. Yeah. And thank you for the invitation. I think it's great pulling in philosophers and theologians and pastors and computer scientists. I mean, it makes for rich conversation. So thanks for inviting me. Awesome.